Good afternoon, CS109. How are you guys doing today? Oh, fantastic. Okay, that's what I liked here. I hope you guys had a wonderful, wonderful weekend. I was gone for a little bit last week, but I'm healthy, I'm back, I'm here for the rest of the quarter. Though, as you know, that's going to include a Thanksgiving break coming up pretty soon. Uh, oh my gosh, is this one of my favorite lectures ever. You chose a fantastic lecture to come to. It is one of the most interesting lectures in terms of intellectual foundations for great ideas. It is one of the most used for lectures. We will be building machine learning upon what we learned today. Uh, and certainly you'll see things like this in the final in your sections. Uh, and it also happens to be a bit independent of what we've talked about before because it's such an exciting day for CS109. We've done counting theory. We've done core probability. We talked about random variables. We talked about lots of random variables being random together. Then we had this wonderful little aside where we went to uncertainty theory. We learned about great ideas in the world of probability like the central limit theorem, and we're ready for the final section of CS109 where we take what we've learned about probability and we create something truly useful out of it, uh, which has this big overarching label of machine learning. And today is the first class of that new section. How exciting. So today is the day where we bridge from probability theory into artificial intelligence. Sound good? Yeah, yeah let's go do it. Let's go learn some things. Okay, so machine learning. Uh, it's a story of today's class, and because I was in kind of like a Disney mood when I made this, we're going to use Lion King as our, our narrative for today. So we're going to be telling you this wonderful story uh, of machine learning. On some level, the questions that are posed by machine learning have already showed up in CS109. Remember when we did WebMD Health, where we talked about probabilistic models? We ended up with these wonderful things called Bayesian networks, and we got to the point where if you knew all of these conditional probabilities, you could use general inference and you could ask sir, any probability question you cared about from this model. But there is this one question we've never answered, which is, where do those numbers come from? And a few times in class, I alluded to, oh, we can learn them from data. And that's really what the focus of machine learning is. Oh, oops, suspense. What's machine learning? At this point in CS109, if you're given a model with all the probabilities necessary, you can make predictions, which is fantastic. That's a really important thing to know how to do. But what if somebody doesn't just give you a model with all the numbers uh, required? What would you have to do? You might have to actually learn all the numbers in your model. And this simple problem turns out to be so deep and complicated, it is the heart and soul of artificial intelligence. I want to lightly point out there is another problem, which is, um, can we also learn the structure of a probabilistic model from data too? And I just want to lightly note that that's so cool, but I'm going to try and you know limit what I teach you in CS109. If it was up to me, I would teach you everything I possibly know, but it's, it's nice to have a, a self-contained class. So we're just going to focus on machine learning and not structure learning. And that simple problem, where do numbers and models come from is the heart and soul of this thing called machine learning. Now, machine learning, as you may know, is related to a few other terms. Machine learning is one way of doing artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, making programs that do something slightly interesting, and then machine learning says, I'm gonna learn how to do something slightly interesting by learning parameters from data. I do want to lightly note that you might have heard of a thing called deep learning, and deep learning is a particular type of machine learning for a particular type of model, but it all funder, falls under this big umbrella of machine learning. And this is what the rest of CS109 is going to look like. We will teach you deep learning, but before you learn deep learning, you need to know two of the most classic algorithms in machine learning, which are called naive Bayes and logistic regression. And in order to get there, we need to build you a theoretical foundation. And this theoretical foundation has a name. It's called parameter estimation. And it's a nice, uh, unassuming name that covers a lot of beautiful theory. I'm going to teach you three ways that you could do machine learning, this foundational theory for how you get parameters from data, and then we'll build these two algorithms on top of it unbiased estimators, a thing called maximum likelihood, and Bayesian estimation. Sound good? Oh, let's do it. I do want to have a quick aside. Hey, can't we just like jump into using TensorFlow and start doing deep learning right now? <laughs> 
On some level you could. Every single person in this room, if you wanted to just go pull up the most modern library and train a deep learning algorithm, it wouldn't be that hard. The hard part would be is if you tried to do something creative on top of it, if you wanted to debug it, or if you wanted to kind of invent the next step in machine learning. And for lots of reasons, we think that there are going to be many new steps. And in CS109, the idea I would like to give you is the theory behind what happens in something like TensorFlow. And it's not because I just like love theory and I think that's the only thing that's important, but because the technologies on top of the theory are moving quite fast, knowing the theory will help you invent the new technologies, and it'll also help you stay relevant as the technologies grow. So while it would be really cool to download TensorFlow, I think it's really critical that we all learn the beautiful mathematics that go into this great idea that has changed the world. Do I have you hooked? <laughs> okay, let's go do this. Oh, um, there are, just to give you a sense of some of the open problems, Machine learning, what we're going to learn about, traditionally uses a lot of data. So if you say, hey computer, learn about the concept of a chair. Computer's like, I've got you if you give me like a million examples. And we're like, okay, here's a million examples of a chair, and then it, the computer learns what a chair is. But humans are so much smarter, and we've talked about this before. If I told you, there's a new symbol, you've never seen it before. Do you need a million examples to start recognizing other versions of the symbol? No, you guys can learn after just one single training example. How clever are you? And this tells you the story of machine learning is not done. There is room for improvement. There are open problems for you all to solve. So let's learn some theory. <laughs> oh, my segue. Okay, and I will note that the open problems that exist in machine learning, they're especially true for the human problems that you might care about. It's for the places where artificial intelligence interacts with uh, needs of humans, there's a lot of problems that people haven't really thought of, and there's a lot of open opportunities for some advancement. So, you guys want to push on these grand challenge? Let's understand the theory. You want to understand how this thing is really working? Like when people say artificial intelligence, what they really mean? You want to demystify that? Let's learn the theory. And so our movie begins. <laughs> da, 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 da. We're going to learn parameter to estimation. <laughs> parameter estimation is a simple idea. We've seen lots of probability distributions, and often those probability distributions, whether they have single random variables or multiple ones, will have these special numbers. And these special numbers tell you what the distribution is. The special numbers have a name. They're called parameters. We call these parametric models because, you know, if you wanted to define a whole normal, you don't have to describe every single point in that bell curve. You just have to give me two numbers, these two parameters. If you want to describe a Poisson, you don't have to describe every single point in the probability mass function of a Poisson, you just give me the lambda. So any model which is defined by numbers we call parametric models, and the par parameters are where the real model comes from. So I can tell you that something's Poisson, but if you really wanted to solve problems using that random variable, you'd need to know what lambda was. And I could tell you I have a whole probabilistic model, but if you don't have values for all of your parameters, then it won't be able to do very many interesting things for you. A little bit of notation. We're gonna now start referring to all of these different things as parameters, and we're gonna start using the symbol theta to represent parameters in general. Does that sound good? Often theta will be just like a single parameter, but sometimes models like a normal might have more than one number. And so you can think of theta as a vector. Just to be clear, in this terminology of parameters, because we're gonna be learning parameter estimation, in our beautiful Bayesian networks, there was a lot of numbers, and those numbers, those are all parameters too. And the name of the game for today's class is getting all of these parameters from data. Cool? Rocking. Any questions on terminology? And this fits the general machine learning format. The general machine learning format has three major stages. The first major stage is you have a real world problem and you model it. You say, I think this is a Poisson, or I have a Bayesian network that's going to represent this problem. And you end up with a formal model. But that formal model has a bunch of numbers left to be filled in. These numbers that we call parameters. So that's stage one in machine learning. Stage two in machine learning is, okay, somebody just gave you a model. They say that there's gonna be numbers, but we don't know what those numbers are. But they also give you training data. 
And from this training data, we're going to choose really wonderful values of thetas um, so that we we'll end up with a model filled with numbers, and then we can answer probability questions. So that second stage, parameter estimation, has another name called training, which you might sometimes hear, because it's coming from, it's getting its estimate for the parameters from training data. Okay, so here's our pass, and I have wild news for you guys. We need to be able to estimate these parameters, but we already have some methods for estimating parameters. And I just want to revisit them really quickly before we jump into more general methods. The first way we have for estimating parameters is called unbiased estimators. So, you know, if I told you we have a bunch of data uh, and they're all IID, because of the central limit theorem, we know that this is always a sample mean. And, and we derived earlier that the sample variance also has a closed form equation. This applies for any data set. So if you have a data set, we already have a method for estimating the mean and the variance, which means if like you had to fit a Gaussian and you just had data points, you kind of have a method for already estimating parameters. It's not very general. It'd be hard to imagine how you could use this for like your Bayesian network. But in some sense, we do already have some really basic tools for estimating parameters from data. We call these our unbiased estimators, and that's just because in expectation, this will be the right number. It won't always be the right average, but in expectation, it will be the true average. This number, your guess for variance, won't always be the right variance, but in expectation, it will be the right value. And these just leave so much to be desired. They just don't solve parameter estimation in general. What we're going to learn about today is maximum likelihood estimation, the theory behind a general method for choosing numbers in a model. OK. And to drive that home, there's lots of different algorithms or things I could show you which are hard to fit. And I do want to pull up our course reader. By the way, we've been writing a whole bunch of new things in the course reader. There's a whole bunch of new examples. But you know, one example of something that would be really hard to fit using unbiased estimators would be this new model I give you called a mixture of Gaussians. It says there is some Gaussian A and some Gaussian B, and there's, um, every data point is more likely to come from B than A. And altogether, this leads to one probability distribution. I know that there's these five parameters. I can tell you how they're related, but you have to guess the numbers. This is very difficult using something like unbiased estimators. So we need a more general tool. So enter this great idea in machine learning. And to do that, I want to go back to a Gaussian. I want to go back to the problem of estimating parameters. I don't want to use unbiased estimators, but I want to show you a demo which highlights a new way of thinking. And this new way of thinking will give us a general way for doing parameter estimation. Ready? Let's do it. I have a classic version of parameter estimation problem for you. I give you all of these data points. I give you a model. I say that I think these data points come from a Gaussian. You now need to do parameter estimation, which means you have to give me a mean and you have to give me a variance. You have to give me the numbers of the parameters. We already have a way of doing that, but I want to solve this problem using a different method. What I'd like to do is I'd like to focus on a simple idea. See up here, I have different values of these parameters. And in this graph, I do something interesting. These vertical lines are all the data points I, that you're trying to come up with parameters to describe. Is that making sense? And here are guesses for mean and variance. I calculate this expression called likelihood. And likelihood just says, if this was the true mean, and this was the true variance, what's the probability of you seeing each of these points? So what's the probability of seeing this point under those parameters times this point, times this point, times this point, times this point? And the crazy idea is I'm going to let people play around with these numbers, and we're going to watch likelihood go up or down. So if these are our data points, this blue line is parameter mean equals 5 and standard deviation equals 3. Do you guys want to see me make standard deviation bigger or smaller? Okay, watch what happens when I make it smaller. See that likelihood expression? It's currently 4 times 10 to the negative 19th. 
Whoa, it changed a lot. Did it get bigger or smaller? Yeah, it got bigger. So it used to be 4 times 10 to the 19th. Now it's almost 7 times 10 to the 19th. It almost doubled in likelihood. There's still a very small number, but that very small number got bigger. So that's saying if you had those parameters, your data looks more likely. It's more probable that you would have seen the data that you saw under these parameters. Doesn't say that these are the best parameters. It's just more likely than the other ones we tried. But we can try other ones. Do you guys want to make this variance bigger or smaller? Okay, and we can keep going, and I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to stop when the likelihood starts to go down. So it got, went up, it went up, it went up, it went up, oh, this is very exciting. It went uh, up, it went up, oh, definitely better with smaller variances. Oh, this is great. Will it just keep going up? No, 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 it's no longer going up. But, you know, maybe I haven't changed this parameter. I can change this one. Oh, that got worse. Oh, that got better. It got better when I made the mean a little bit higher. Oh, fantastic. No. Okay, I like those ones. <laughs> did you see what I did here? What a funny way of choosing a mean and variance. So what did I do here? I said, I'm going to just twiddle around with these numbers until the data starts to look more likely. And to be clear, the likelihood in this situation, I'm going to use L for likelihood, it's just the product over every single data point, the probability density function of that data point, in the world where you have that particular mean equals 5.5, and the standard deviation equals 3.1.1. Oh, so it's just saying, you know, every single data point, look at its probability density function and multiply it together. And then my crazy idea was we're just going to twiddle around the values of the parameters until this goes up the most. Crazy? Did you guys buy that that would work? Did you know that most AI has a human being behind the screens and they're just like twiddling numbers until likelihood goes up? There's a secret, like inside your smartwatch, there's actually a tiny little person who's being like, yeah, actually let's make a uh, variance go up a little bit. No, that's not how it works. Okay, so this is a really cool idea. This is a powerful idea, which is that for any model you have, one very reasonable theme for how you could choose your parameters is choose whichever parameters makes the data look pretty likely. And we haven't talked about how a computer could do this automatically. We've just given you a perspective on how we could choose parameters. And that perspective, I like to think of this metaphor of there's this big soundboard, and you're like a sound engineer. And when you're choosing parameters, you're just trying to choose the values that make your data look as likely as possible in the world of your model. And you can twiddle those sliders a little bit, and each slider is a parameter's value, until it's like the perfect sound. And by perfect sound, I mean it makes the data look so likely. Did you guys, oh. Okay, the first insight then that we've got so far, and this is a critically cool idea in the world of probability, is that we should find which parameters maximize a measure of likelihood. And that's going to require us to think about arguments that maximize something else. I want to think about which values of mean and standard deviation maximize this thing. Arguments that maximize. Have you guys ever seen a thing called argmax? If not, what a beautiful day in your lives. We're going to be talking about argmax. First of all, this is a general conversation. Let's take a step back from probability. Let me give you a function. This function is negative x squared plus 5. And I've so helpfully drawn our function. Aw, what a cute little function. It looks like a rocket ship. First of all, have you guys ever seen a max function? A max function can take in an expression, and it will tell you what's the largest value that this expression can take. So think about it for a second. I'm going to have you shout it out. What is the maximum value that this expression can take on? And you can look at my handy little chart. Right, think about it. Three, two, one. All together? Five. I feel like that was like kind of like a, a, a D flat. But can we do that in like a C? Like five, 
Okay, one, two, three. Five. No, five. five. That was getting there. We'll see if we can nail it with the argmax. Now, max is a thing that we all feel comfortable. It's the largest value that this can take on, and we've decided that this is a five. The argmax is a different concept. It doesn't care about the largest value. It asks the question, what input leads to the largest value? So if I took that exact same expression and instead asked, what is the argument that maximizes it? I will get a different answer. And in C, in three, two, one. Zero. Zero. Okay, one, two, three. Zero. Oh, okay, it's getting better, but we should definitely be sticking to probability. <laughs> I kid, I kid. So the difference between five and zero here is five is the largest value you can take on and zero is the input which maximizes it. And this is a very important concept because we're not really interested in how likely is our data. What we're really interested in is which input of mean and standard deviation made the data look as likely. And that will be an argmax. A beautiful piece of theory that you must know about the argmax is what happens if you take the argmax of the log of a function. So imagine you cared about the argmax of a function. Mind-blowing claim for you. Argmax of a function is the exact same as argmax of a log of a function. You're like, what? No, it can't be the same, they're close, right? No, they're not just close, they're the same. So if you take your function from before, so, if I said, what is the argmax of negative x squared plus 5, it is? Zero. Yeah. I'm giving up my whole C thing. <laughs> and how about, what's the argmax of this? Zero. Zero. That is my claim for you, is that if you take any function, the argument which maximizes is the same as the argument which maximizes the log of that function. And it's a crazy thing, but it comes from, because of a very simple property. Log is monotonic. If you put larger numbers into a log, you'll get a larger number back. And because of that, whichever number led to a larger value of your function, or log of a function, we know that it must have been the same uh, large output for the function itself. So because log is monotonic, there is this one critically important claim. Whichever mean and standard deviation maximizes this expression, will be the exact same mean and standard deviation which maximizes the log of this expression. And that expression is the pi of f of xi. That is just a copy of that. Insanity. So let me pause here for a second and see like, you know, what's interesting about this to people. Yes. Be useful in the case where we're dealing with smaller probabilities, we can just take the log of them and get the argument. Yeah, you're seeing exactly where I'm going. Can I go back to that demo I gave you? Did you notice how I had likelihood and it's this tiny, tiny, tiny number? Notice how below it I also had a thing called log likelihood. That's just the log of this likelihood. And when I was changing, both of these numbers were going up. Like the likelihood would go up and the log likelihood would go up with it because of the monotonic property of logs. Um, and this is a beautiful thing for two reasons. One, computers kind of are not so good at representing very, 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 very small numbers. And computers are much better representing logs of those numbers. Uh, and then there'll be another reason. But I wanna be mysterious a little bit. So I'll hold on to my other reason. But you see exactly where I'm going. So where have we been in this lecture? A beautiful idea, of, like we have this crazy important goal. Everyone in CS19 needs to how, know how to choose numbers for models. Maximum likelihood starts with this beautiful idea. Choose the parameters that make your data look as likely as possible. And then the next idea I've got for you is, okay, now we've got to choose these numbers. Well, we'll need to do an argmax, and we can do the argmax of the log likelihood instead. Okay. So the argmax of some function is always the same as the argmax of the log. And logs we love. We like have a soft, tender part in our hearts for logs. We see logs and you're like, you've done a solid so many times. And like we, we like shed a little tear for happiness when we see logs because so many things become much easier. 
A lot of equations will simplify, like log a, b, a times b is equal to log a plus log b. Um, and actually, it is worth noting when I mention logs, I don't often write a base because I actually mean the natural base. Some people would write this as ln, but I've gotten the habit of just calling this log. Okay, we've developed a few critical pieces. We're ready to start putting things together. Maximum likelihood estimation. I wrote it out on one slide. It's so important. I wrote the spark notes on the board so you can always follow along. The great idea is you have a general method for choosing numbers for a model. It starts by defining the likelihood for one data point. The second goal is to come up with a log likelihood function. And then the simple idea is we are going to state that the optimal parameters are which ones are the arg max of the log likelihood function. And then finally, once you've stated that, you would then use an optimization algorithm. And the optimization algorithm can help you find the arg max. There's lots of cool computer science functions that can do arg maxes. I will tell you about a few of them in CS109. Now, as I wrote up on the board, what is this likelihood function I've been talking about? Well, if you have iid random variables, that means they're all independent. So it says, how likely is the data given the current status of the parameters? And that will just be loop over all your independent data points and talk about how likely each one is given the parameters. We want to find the parameters that maximize this. That's the simple idea. When you start, you will write down this expression and you will replace this with either the PDF, if you have a continuous random variable, the probability mass function if you have a discrete one, or the joint distribution if it's some sort of probabilistic model. Okay. That's how you do step one. And step two is just take the log of this. So story so far, you can choose parameters by finding the argmax of the log likelihood of our data. And to write this out in an equation, the likelihood is the product of the likelihood of each data point for IID random variables. The log likelihood, whichever parameters make this the biggest, will also be the parameters that make this the biggest, but this can be much easier to work with. And notice the first thing that happens. When you take a log of this expression, that log used to live outside of the columns. But remember, the log is like a tractor, and it sees the columns, and it's like And then you get the columns get collapsed into the summation, and the log's like, I'm inside. That's just a general property of logs, if you didn't know. Um, so log of all your data points will lead to the sum of the log of the likelihood of each data point on its own. And then we're going to state that the best parameters that we can guess, and we put funny little hats on things that we guess, um, is going to be the argmax, whichever parameter makes this as large as possible. I want to take a moment for conversation. I want you to have a nice little chat with the person next to you. Take two minutes. What is confusing about this? What's interesting about this? What questions do you have? See if you can come up with a good question with the person next to you, and then let's talk about this all together. What a crazy set of ideas. Go for it. Okay, I can guess one of your questions like, what's this gonna look like when we apply it to a real problem? We'll get there in a second. Other questions that have come up? 
Curiosities, yes? I'm just a little confused. Isn't the R max of the log, wouldn't that be infinity? Like, <clears throat> what exactly are we doing there? So, for any particular values of parameters, you can calculate log likelihood of your data. And notice that as I change these parameters, that changes. And it's not the case that infinity, so saying that infinity is the argmax is saying if you put infinity into these numbers, then that would be your argmax. Of course, this isn't infinity, but it's getting there, right? But if I put infinity in front of parameters, look at my current value of log likelihood. It's negative, negative 4,549. That feels like it's better than negative 300, but it's worse. So putting in infinite values into parameters doesn't actually maximize the log of the likelihood. The thing that maximizes the log of likelihood will be the same thing that maximizes the likelihood itself, which will in fact be pretty good guesses of the, our parameters. Does that answer the question? Very, very good question. Other questions come up? Yes. Um, on the slide where you had like the different steps for the maximum likelihood algorithm, um, yeah, the first step was like deciding them all for the distribution of your samples, defining the PMF, the PMF in your sample. How do you like, how do you do that? How do you decide what your model is? Good question. So this is assuming somebody gave you a model. So at this point we're saying, we're telling you your data is Gaussian. We're telling you your data is Pareto. We're telling you that your data are joint samples from this tiny little Bayesian network. And there's these missing numbers in all of those models. And your job is to find the missing numbers. There is a different task of you decide what the structure is yourself. And I'm going to leave that till 228. Good question. Though we can talk about, we've done that in BATS. We've like touched upon structure learning a little bit. But this is the question of figuring out parameters. You guys need to see this, you need to see this live because so far it's all theory and no application. And you can solve so many problems once you know how to, ooh, but we have a bad guy. Argmax, we haven't talked about how to do argmax. This would work great and we could apply this if we knew how to do argmax, but we haven't talked about this at all. I just said do argmax and you're like, okay, great, I'll do argmax. Two options I'm gonna tell you. The first one you learned about in calculus class and we're gonna start with that. It's just straight optimization. Let's say I gave you a function, negative x squared, but this time plus four, just to mix things up a little bit. And I said, find the argmax of this expression. You might just be able to look at the expression and be like, it's zero, but this is not supposed to be using your visual cortex. We're trying to solve this using math. How could we solve this using math? And you're like, oh, my calculus teacher told me something about this. He, she said that I should find the derivative and set it equal to zero. Have you guys had a calculus teacher tell you something like that? Thank you, Mr. Blanton. So if you look at this part that maximizes the arguments, notice that there's a derivative of zero out there. Must be true at a max that the derivative must be zero. So one of the things that people will classically do is they'll take the derivative. Ooh, derivative is scary, but we have Wolfram Alpha, not so scary. You put it in Wolfram Alpha, that tells you the derivative of this is 2x. And you're like, 2x, what does that mean? Well. If x is three, that means that the derivative at that point is six. Uh, and so we can figure out the derivative, oh, wait, where's my negative sign here? Should be a negative sign, cheeky Chris. Turns out zero doesn't really mess things up. Negative two x, so if x is six or three, then your derivative at that point is negative six. The slope is negative six at that point. We don't care about all points, we just care about the points where this derivative is equal to zero. So what we could do is we could say, okay, take this derivative and tell me the value of x which makes this equal to zero. And if you solve for the value of x that makes this equal to zero, you get that, okay, when x is zero, the derivative is zero, so this is a good hypothesis for a maxima point. And that is one way of doing argmax. It has some downsides. You could find the worst possible parameters, because this could be a minimum, uh, and obviously, it might not scale when you get to bigger and bigger models, but this is just fine for getting us warmed up. We have our first algorithm for doing argmax. Yeah, question. Does this work on a function with multiple um, maxes and mins? No. If there's multiple maxes and mins, you have to do a next level analysis. You have to decide 
are these maxes and uh, are these mins? Uh, and you'd have to look at the second derivative at minimum. So this works for pretty simple things. This will just get us over the hump so I can show you some examples. But we're gonna need, keep in mind, I want a more satisfying argmax. Everyone should want more satisfying argmax than this. Okay. Okay, yeah, and this is all the notes of like, this is why this is so limited. And don't worry about it, we'll just get a better version later. So this is your general MLE formula. If you want to find um, parameter, you say, what's the likelihood? What's the log likelihood? And then you find the, the value which maximizes the log likelihood, you do the argmax. Let us start with kind of a medium difficulty example. It's not the hardest thing in the world, but it's gonna be a pretty good way for us to get used to doing this. It won't be like, once you get used to MLE, you can solve so many interesting problems, but let's start with something that's in the wheelhouse of what we know. An MLE problem would generally look like this. I'm telling you my model. In this case, my model is that every data point has a single value, and that value is drawn from a Poisson. And I've seen you know, 12 different independent samples. From this thing that I'm gonna call data, if this is my data set, the challenge of MLE is to estimate the parameters. And the parameters for a Poisson is lambda. Remember, lambda is just the word for this symbol. Xi, when I use this notation, I mean like the ith value in my data points. So if I gave you these data points, how could we estimate lambda? Again, for Poisson, we have some pretty reasonable ways of guessing what lambda is from this. You know, maybe you could imagine a way of doing it uh, without going to a first principle approach like MLE. But let's use this as our first opportunity to go end to end with MLE. You guys ready for it? You guys, I'm just warning you, you're gonna look like really, really legit mathematicians once you get used to MLE because the math looks super impressive, but really we're just always following this uh, formula. But when you get back to Thanksgiving, I want you to do a little MLE and just like let your parents see and they're like, wow, kids learning so much at Stanford. Okay, <laughs> let's try this out. So I'm going to use this notation for our data points. I gave you 12 data points, but now we're gonna call them X1 to Xn. Why? Just to use a little bit of notation. I'm assuming that every single one of them are IID from the same Poisson, and my job is to try and estimate lambda based on these data points. And I'm going to use this recipe, the MLE recipe, and the end result of the MLE recipe is going to be an estimate for lambda. It starts very humbly. You have to say, how likely is a single data point if I tell you what lambda is? So if I told you lambda was five, how likely is a data point? Hardest part of MLE sometimes, actually. No, I want people to sit with it. The tension. What is the likelihood of one data point? Okay, I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> it's very simply the probability mass function for, uh, for a Poisson. So if you go back to your course reader and you say like, I have a Poisson, if I told you what lambda was, we can talk about how likely it is that you saw a particular value x sub i. And you can say, what's the likelihood of seeing x sub i? Well, it's e to the power of negative whatever your lambda was, lambda to the power of x sub i, and then x sub i is factorial. That's just the probability mass function. And that's really your first step. So the first step um, is to just write what likelihood is. But that's just likelihood of one data point. If we talk about the likelihood of all of our data given a particular lambda, because our data is IID, the likelihood is really this expression, and this expression is just gonna be the product of the likelihood of each data point on its own. You can't always do this. It has to be independent for this to be true. But because it's independent, this is true, and then we can just plug in this expression we had for one data point, and we're just gonna multiply it for different data points. If you had to calculate likelihood, you'd write a for loop. And for everything, you'd look at the value you know, from our previous slide, you'd take six and plug it in for x sub one, one for x sub two, and so on. And each time, you'd be able to calculate this inner term, product them all together, and that's the likelihood if I told you lambda was, say, five. Yes? So, what would it look like if this data was 
wasn't independent. Like, what else could we do? Run, run! Don't even look back. Just go. <laughs> okay. Uh, if the data was not independent, you enter a really weird theoretical world. But good news: almost all data is assumed to be IID. We almost always assume that each data point is some independent draw condition on the parameters. I'm having trouble like imagining what this much like dependent data. Like, is there an example of something that is dependent? Uh, I'm going to give you an example, but then I'm going to tell you the first thing a mathematician would do would assume it's independent anyways. <laughs> so, um, let's say these lambdas are like how many people get processed by a cashier. Maybe like how long it takes one person, like one cashier, to process a chunk in an hour influences the next one because it leaves a queue. So there could be a way that they're not actually independent, but guess what? First thing we're going to do is assume independence because none of the math ever works out if it's not independent. So IID, often an assumption that we need. But most data actually is a very, very, very good assumption. Okay, at this point, if you gave me any value of lambda, I could plug it in with my particular data set and I could say, how likely does my data look in the presence of your lambda. And we could play the game we play with the Gaussians, where you're just gonna like twiddle on lambdas and you could try all the different values of lambdas, but that's not so fun. We'd like a computer to do the twiddling for us. Which leads us to the next step. We're gonna try and find the lambda which maximizes this expression, which is the same as the lambda which maximizes the log of this expression. And you're like, I have to do logs. No, we get to do logs. We are the humble users of this beautiful tool, which is the log. So I just write the log of the expression I had before. And remember the first thing the log does is like, I wanna go live inside the house and I'm gonna break down the columns as I go there. Okay, great, the log went inside the house and you have like the log of this nasty expression and you don't wanna do it, but then you're like, wait a second, log of E is a good time, isn't it? And you're like, yeah, that's just gonna be negative lambda. And you're like, I can do log of this expression plus log of this expression minus log of this expression. And when I do log of this expression, that exponent just becomes something that goes in front. And look how nice that is. When I took the log, it turned this nasty expression into something actually quite a lot easier to work with. The log is your friend. The other reason I was gonna tell you why we use logs is it makes math much, much easier. So at this point, we have a special expression we call the log likelihood. And the final thing we want to do is we wanna choose the lambda which makes this expression as large as possible. Maybe when you put five in, it's large as possible. When you put three in, it's as large as possible. We would like to choose the arg max of this log likelihood. Whew. Notice how I put a derivative here. It's because no matter which optimization technique you use, you will most likely need to derive, take the derivative of this with respect to your parameters. You guys are ready for some calculus? Definitely could use Wolfram Alpha here but we can do this one on our own. In fact, this is the level of calculus that I think it would be nice to know how to do on our own. Derive that expression with respect to lambda. Okay, you guys can think about it. First of all, the derivative of a sum is just gonna be the sum of derivative. So the derivative will just move right into this inner part. And you're like, derivative of that term seems not so bad. Derivative of this term, well, it's got a log. But we can do that, it seems not so bad. Derivative of this term looks awful. What's the derivative of a factorial? Oh my God, we're gonna need like a smooth continuous approximation. Wait, somebody's shaking their heads. Why, why? There's no lambda. And if there's no lambda, the derivative is just zero, right? As lambda changes, how does this change? Zero, fantastic, what a beautiful thing. Okay, now we're feeling brave, we go and do our derivative. So the derivative of that term with respect to lambda is, well, the derivative uh, is gonna go inside the sum. The derivative of lambda with respect to lambda, just one. So that was a negative lambda, this becomes a negative one. The derivative of that log, so xi log of lambda, well, the derivative of log of lambda is just one over lambda, and that xi looks like a constant. And then, as we mentioned, that negative log xi factorial just goes away. So we have that this is the derivative. I'm then going to do this thing where I'm gonna take this derivative and I'm gonna move the sum as far in as possible so that we really only deal with the terms that have i's in them. There's no i's here and there's no i's there. When I move this sum through this negative one, it's like you added up negative one n times, that just becomes a negative n. And when I move the sum into this inner term, it's like every single term is multiplied by one over lambda and then you're summing up the xi's. So this is how that term gets rearranged. 
At this point, we have the derivative of log likelihood with respect to lambda. Your calculus teacher, Mr. Blanchard. Did Mr. Blanchard teach anyone else here? I don't know, my Malaysian probability teacher. I heard he went to Brazil and he taught some people. Maybe, you, no? <laughs> okay, we all had different probability or calculus teachers, but all of our calculus teachers would have told us something like, if you wanna find the value which max, or maximizes, you can take your derivative, set it to zero. So I'm gonna take my derivative, set it to zero, and when I solve this expression for lambda, I end up with lambda equals the sum over all my xi's divided by n, where n is the size of my data set. Wait a second. That's like a screen filled with mathematics. And at the end, it just says, take the average of your data points. <laughs> right? This is saying, like, take all your 20 values, add them up together, and then divide by how many values you have. You're like a page of mathematics for what? The sample mean? And yeah, for Poisson, the maximum likelihood estimation for lambda says you just average your data points. And that actually feels pretty good. And MLE is Poisson for the sample. This is, a, this is a good time. It's a good result. It was a lot of math, but it led to something that feels about right. Okay, I'm gonna make us do one more simple example before we jump into solving MLE for things we haven't seen the answer to yet. Can we do one more simple example? Let's drive this home. Bernoulli, oh man. Consider random variables, and we're gonna assume that they all come from Bernoulli, and you wanna figure out what is your best estimate for the parameters. What's the parameters of Bernoulli? I, S, P. And recall that your data, in this case, is gonna be like zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, you know, zero. And we're assuming that these are all IIDs pulls from the same Bernoulli with the same parameter p, and we're trying to figure out what is the best value of p here. Again, you could probably come up with a pretty reasonable formula for how you could have gotten this, but I want to use this opportunity to flex our MLE muscles. So we're going to try and use all these steps and derive it using MLE. Okay. First step, you have to drive the formula for log likelihood. And it's going to be the sum of the log of the likelihood of each value. And at this point, you're like, okay, what's the likelihood of each value? It's a Bernoulli. What's the probability mass function of a Bernoulli? And then you look up on the course reader and you get something like this. <laughs> and you're like, I need to substitute this into that equation. And the Bernoulli says, if your value is one, the probability was p. If your value is zero, your probability was one minus p, whatever p was. And that's really cute and very helpful, except it's not at all differentiable. Wait, I promised Bernoulli would be easy. Ah! <laughs> oh no. I'm gonna show you the slickest trick. And you need to learn this now because you're gonna see this in 221. And you're gonna see it in 229. And you're gonna see it in 220x, whatever. And they're not gonna explain it to you. They're just gonna say it as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. People don't use this as the probability mass function for a Bernoulli. Instead, a lot of times, you'll see people write a continuous version of that same table. So to be clear, this table is saying the probability of one is p and the probability of zero is one minus p. Make sense? That's fine, but this graph is not differentiable. And so people use a different expression for the probability mass function of Bernoulli. You ready for it? They use that. You're like, what is that? <laughs> it is particularly p raised to the power of x times one minus p raised to the power of one minus x. And you're like, what are you guys on? Well, it turns out this is a continuous version of that expression. Let's try plugging in zeros for x. If you plug in a zero for x, what's p to the power of zero? This whole term goes away. And one minus zero is what? One. So like this whole term goes away. If you put in a zero for x, you're left with one minus p. What if you put in a one for x? Well, then this whole term will go away because one minus one is zero. And that whole term goes away and you're just gonna be left with a p. If you plug in a zero and a one, this crazy formula picks up what this graph left off. 
if you were to graph it, it has values for like, what's the probability that your Bernoulli gave you like a 0 0.3 and you're like, what? That doesn't make sense. It just happens to make sense at the values 0 and 1 and it happens to be derivable. And just to be clear, if you put p equals 0 0.2, this would be 0 0.2 to the power of x times 0 0.8 to the power of 1 minus x. And that x and the 1 minus x are just choosing whether or not you should use this term or you should choose that term. Insanity. But learn it, live it, love it now because people are going to just state this as if it were obvious in the future. And they will not explain it with a nice little chart like this. Okay, so before I jump back into Bernoulli's, just know that this is a continuous derivable version of the probability mass function of a Bernoulli. Craziness. Okay, so if we want to do a Bernoulli using our good old friend MLE, you write the likelihood. And here, instead of writing the bar chart, we're going to write that continuous version of the probability mass function. Then you say, what's the likelihood of all the data? It's just the products over all our IID samples. So we're going to loop over all these values and then either choose p or 1 minus p, depending on whether or not the value is 1 or 0. Then we do the log, and when you do the log of this expression, yikes, yikes. Oh wait, actually quite nice, because the log of a product becomes a sum of logs. You take the log of expression at this point, you have log likelihood, and my claim is you should choose whichever p makes that equation as large as possible. Arg max it. How do you arg max it? Derive it and set it equal to zero. I'm gonna let you do this on your own if you want, um, but if you derive it and set it equal to zero, you'll end up with this wonderful result that your best value for p is equal to, drum roll, sum all your values, divide by n. A whole page of mathematics, and what did we derive? Just choose your p to be the sample mean. Uh, and it's an unbiased estimator is a really fancy way of saying the sample mean. So all this math, and it says you should choose p to be the sample mean. It says add up all these values, divide by n, and that's a good estimate for p. That's what MLE says. It says that will be the value which makes this data look as likely as possible. But on some level, that feels pretty good. For Bernoulli, again, it's the unbiased estimator. I promise it won't always be the sample mean, but for now we can just be like, that's a good time. We've done our math for two examples, Poisson and Bernoulli, and both times they led to a result. That seems pretty reasonable. And this is where we depart off into the wild unknown because we're going to be able to do this for more and more interesting problems. If n was 10 for Bernoulli, I just want to make this a little bit instantialized. So imagine you have 10 data points and you want to choose a value p. Just to make sure we're all following along with what we're trying to do here. You're assuming that all the data points are Bernoulli. You're assuming they all share the same value p and we don't know what p is. What is PMLE if this, these were your data points? And I give you a few options. You can say that MLE says that P should be 1. You can say MLE is that P should be 0.5. MLE says that P should be 0.8. And MLE says P should be 0 0.2. Talk about it with the person next to you. See if you can answer this. But also, as always, try and come up with a really good question because I bet other people in the class would benefit from that too. So think about this. A quick check. What does MLE of a Bernoulli tell us? Okay, in the note of <laughs> C, no, I'm just joking. Okay, yay or nay? Yay. 
<laughs> People really felt sad for you. They're like, nay. <laughs> we wanted it to be you, but it's not you. <laughs> Almost ever in this class. Um, yeah, and it, what we're saying is a good estimate for your parameter is, you know, sum up all your values. In this case, there's 10 values. If you add them up, you'll get eight. Um, and then divide by n, which is how many data points you have. And, and that's the MLE estimate. For what it's worth, a beta distribution would give you a much richer representation of your belief in the probability. So MLEs, maybe we can recognize one of the limitations here. It doesn't give us a rich representation of, of expressing how certain we are. Instead, it's just giving a single number. It's just coming with a single number estimate. And that's what MLE does. Based on data and a model, it will give you just a single number back. OK. Yay, you guys got it right. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, and you know we could have gotten it by our MLE estimate. I want to take a moment, though, and talk about likelihood on its own. So likelihood was a step that we used to come up with our prediction for theta. But it's an interesting step on its own because it says, how likely is the data in the case of our particular power uh, setting to our parameters? And the likelihood, if you were to write it down, it says, take p. And we saw eight examples of one, so that will be raised to itself eight times. And we saw two examples of zero, so you'll see one minus p two times. And that's what the likelihood is. And we're going to choose the p's that make this as large as possible. And the claim is that this is the value of p, which makes this as large as possible. Just a little bit of intuition, but not that important. What is really important is this formula. You guys are going to use it in section. You're going to use it on your problem set. You're going to use it on the final exam. You will need to know this MLE formula for starting out with some data and ending up with an estimate for parameters. Yeah, OK, there it is. This is like our little MLE, and we're like so proud. You're like, welcome to the world, MLE. I do want to mention that it's incredibly general. The point of this demo I'm about to show you where we start with data and we're going to estimate the parameters for mean and variance using MLE. The point of this is actually to give you two pieces of insight. And the most important one being that MLE works even if you have more than one number you have to estimate. So for the Gaussian, you have to estimate both mean and variance. So just to be clear, my first little example this was the game we were playing. We were trying to use, choose the mean and the variance, which made our data look as likely as possible. And now we want to do that a little bit more precisely. We'd like to not have to use guess and check. Starts out with saying, how likely is a single data point if you tell me the parameters? And that is just going to be the probability density function. This step is almost always just plug in the PDF, the PMF, or the joint distribution. Then we're going to try to figure out what are our parameters. To do that, we first write log likelihood. And then we're going to try and figure out what is the values of mean and variance which maximize this. When we write down log likelihood, it's just going to be the sum of the log of each of the likelihoods. Who feels like doing this log? Ugh. But and then you look at it, you're like, OK, that'll pull this term apart. And the log of each of the something is actually quite nice. And when you do this, it turns out to be you know, negative log of that constant. And that whole e disappears, and you're just left with what e was raised to the power of when you did the log. Like logs and e's like to cancel out. So in fact, the log of this expression led to something quite nice to work with. So at this point, we have the log likelihood for a normal. And the real learning experience for this one is, um, oh, by the way, and then I just distribute the sum. So this expression. Just a little bit of algebra gives you this one. When you move the sums, have this sum on the side and this sum on the side. The real takeaway I want you guys to get from this next example is when you have log likelihood, if you have more than one parameter, you can choose them simultaneously. If you're using our original idea of optimization, you derive them with respect to each parameter. So you take this expression, derive it with respect to mu. And then you take this log likelihood expression and derive it with respect to sigma, which is your other parameter. If you derive it with respect to mu, you'll get this equation, which you can set to be equal to 0. If you derive it with respect to sigma, don't worry too much about the derivations. Wolfram Alpha could help you there. But if you did it, you would end up with this derivation, which you could then set to equal, equal to 0. So here, I have my log likelihood check. 
then I differentiate log likelihood with respect to each parameter set to equal zero. And one final thing we could do is we could solve for both mu and sigma in these two equations. You have two unknowns, two equations. You're like, hey, Chris, don't I have more unknowns? These are not unknowns. These are your data points. So n is known, xi's are known. Those are all knowns. The only two unknowns we have are mu and sigma. And if you solve them simultaneously, you would get this result. You would get that uh, mean should be equal to, wait a second, that answer we always get, which is the sum over all your data points divided by n. And if you were to solve for this other equation, plugging in your answer for mean, you would end up with your estimate for MLE's variance is going to be equal to take each of your data points, subtract off your mean estimate, square it, and then divide that by n. My big point here is not how you do this optimization with setting it equal to zero. My big point is if you have multiple parameters, it's not a problem. You will have to drive log likelihood with respect to each parameter, but then any optimization algorithm can take it from there. And the setting equal to zero trick works in this case, but another trick I'll teach you in a bit works as well. I did also want to highlight one funny thing here. Who thinks that this is a pretty reasonable statement? If you're guessing the mean based on data, add all your data points together and divide by n. Does that feel like a pretty reasonable way to choose the mean? Yes. The other claim that MLE gives you is that if you want to choose the variance, you use this equation. And does anyone take any issue with this equation? Like, I take issue with this equation. <laughs> yeah. I remember there being an equation maybe last class or a couple of classes ago where you had to divide by n minus <coughs> 1. Absolutely. <coughs> you had to divide by n minus 1. You're right. And the claim was if you try and estimate the variance from data and use this equation, you'll get a number which is too small. Because your guess for the mean was going to be wrong. You always guess statistics wrong. And this one is going to be closer to each of your values. As such, you're going to think that you're varying around the mean less. And it turns out this magical minus one solves it and makes it so that you are not going to be, on average, underestimating. We call this a bias estimator. So this is a great guess for mean based on data. And that's not a really great guess for variance based on data. You're like, MLE, you led us astray. Yeah, sometimes it will do that. So anytime we have like a variance or a standard deviation, if we're not dividing by n minus one, it's considered biased by definition? Yeah, it will always be too small. Does that work for any other estimators? Every estimator will have an unbiased equation. Okay. And so we, for mean, this is the unbiased equation. And for variance, it's got a minus one. And other estimators would need to have an unbiased equation, too. Do we have a biased equation? Uh, ooh. How about that one? <laughs> Anything that's not this is, is the biased equation. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Uh, on the estimator, when you say it's biased, does it got to do with the sample size or something? I was thinking yeah. maybe I'm using minus one music when the sample size is smaller. So the minus one does a magical thing. It just kind of counteracts the fact that this is going to be <coughs> a bad guess of mean. It's going to be too close to your data points, and the minus one really balances that out. But you said something very important. You said sample size, which is a point I'd like to get deeper into. If you have three data points, this is pretty wrong. If you have 10,000 data points, forgetting the minus one really doesn't matter that much. And what I'm going to claim in a little bit is that while MLE doesn't always give you the perfect estimate from your parameters, as your number of data points gets larger and larger, it will get closer and closer. It will converge to the right number. I want to drive this point home with a hilarious example. Let's say you wanted to do MLE and you wanted to choose a uniform. What parameters does a uniform have? Alpha and beta. Alpha and beta. What do those represent? Sorry, yeah, the smallest value that uniform can take on and the largest value. If you wanted to do MLE, you'd start with data, and we'd tell you what values you have for alpha and beta. It turns out I actually constructed these ones with alpha equals 0 and beta equals 1. You can know. But normally, you don't know what these are, and you're trying to guess. If you change alpha, and you look at the likelihood value, notice how it goes up, 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 and then it plummets to 0. 
Why is that? Well, if you say the minimum value that your data points can take on is 0.2, and then you observe a 0.15, this looks impossible. So the likelihood will just get bigger, but if you get, as the minimum value gets larger than your smallest value here, likelihood of your data goes to zero. Same thing happens with the maximum. The maximum will have a pretty high likelihood and always a positive likelihood, but if your maximum is smaller than the large value you saw, then it says your data is impossible given this parameter. And impossible in probability is expressed with a probability of zero or a likelihood of zero. So if you were to choose MLE values, what value do you think you would choose for alpha? You'd say that my alpha here is equal to 0 0.15. That is the alpha which made likelihood the highest. What would you choose for the max value here for beta? What is the arg max of beta in this case, of that beta likelihood with respect to beta? 0 0.75. I told you that the true alpha and beta that I used to generate this data was 0 and 1. But when it had to choose its alpha and beta, it chose different values. In fact, it chose alpha to be the smallest value in this list, and it chose beta to be the largest value in this list. I want to show you this example to drive home a point. Um, do, 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 do. It's this idea of when your numbers are small, it does this thing that we intuitively would call overfitting. It's not trying to generalize to any data it hasn't seen. It's only trying to describe the data it has. So if it's trying to describe these data points, these are pretty reasonable choices for alpha and beta. But if you're trying to describe data points you haven't seen as well, then these aren't really good choices. You want to use something a little bit smaller than what the smallest value you haven't seen. But anyway, some qualities of MLE. In the limit, as data points goes to infinity, it's the best thing. It's potentially biased that we've seen through the uniform and we've seen through the Gaussian, it might choose bad estimators for small data sizes, but also it's one of the most popular things ever used in practice for parameter estimation. Okay, I'm going to show you a few examples, then I'll give us a, a minute to think about it and then we'll spend 10 minutes doing one problem together. On your problem set, you're going to have to do this. You're going to do maximum likelihood estimation of the wind. I'm going to give you a probability density function, and I'm going to give you data, and I say choose the parameter theta based off this data. And you're going to do exactly this. Write the likelihood, write the log likelihood, and then figure out which value maximizes the log likelihood. In section, you're going to do an old exam problem. On the final exam at one point, I said, here is the distribution for length of menstrual cycles. If you take a particular person who has menstruation and they give you some data, could you choose the parameters that would make their data look as likely as possible. This was last time I gave a, a CS109 final. I put this MLE question. I said, how long a phone lasts is known to be coming from this thing called the reliability distribution. It's a probability distribution we've seen, never seen before, but if I gave you data points, like n data points, could you choose the single parameter, which is alpha? And then one of my favorites is this one. And this problem, I have put it into our uh, lecture for today. If you go to today's lecture, we have this exact same problem which says, I give you all these data points. And you know what these data points are? They're sizes, radius of sand on the beach. Which is like, I got really like artistic. I was like, I wanna make art which fits the distribution of the sand size on the beach, which is really like not that important. But what is important is you might wanna fit a Pareto distribution based off data. So based off these dis data points, could you choose the alpha for this particular random variable, which is called the Pareto? We didn't study as one of our core random variables, but using MLE, you could figure this out. This is the sort of thing you could do, sort of thing that could be on your final exam. In fact, this was once on a final exam to give you an idea. I'm gonna give you guys your pedagogical pause, take a minute, and then I'd like to show you what this answer looks like. So take a minute, talk about this with the person next to you, um, or just take a break and think, Whoa, MLE, what a time to be alive. 
I told you all of these data points were pulled from this probability distribution, and I said choose an alpha. Now, I wrote this up and what you could do. So you can check along at home. But the answer to this starts with saying, okay, I'm going to figure out what alpha is, and the way to figure out what alpha is is going to be using MLE. But before I jump into this, any questions come up during your pedagogical pause? Okay. How could you choose this alpha? What's the first thing that you have to do? The first thing you would have to do is you'd have to say, well, I'm told the probability density function for one point, but the first thing I really need is the likelihood function. There it goes. So the likelihood function, and I often think of it as a function of my, my parameter. Why? Because as you change your parameter, the likelihood function will change. Since all my data points are independent, it's going to be the product over all my data points of the likelihood of any one data point in the presence of this parameter. So if I told you alpha was 5, and then you took all these data points, you could loop over each of the, these xi's, and you could plug them into here, and you could get that this is going to be equal to alpha divided by, let me see if I get this right, x to the power of alpha plus 1. But I don't just write x, I write xi to represent that first I take the first data point, then I take the second data point, and each time I plug them into the probability mass function. That's the likelihood, but we don't really need the likelihood. What we really need is the log likelihood. So remember the log likes to go and destroy this whole thing and go inside, and then you get the log of whatever your probability density function was. That's one of your steps in MLE. And if you solve this, it looks a little scary at first, but then you use your powers of logs and you're like, okay, this is just going to be log of alpha. This is going to be minus alpha plus one times log of xi. And at this point, we've got our log likelihood function. If we wanted to choose a value for alpha, what we'd want to really find is what's the derivative of this log likelihood with respect to alpha, because what we really want to figure out is which alpha makes this the largest. We want to argmax this over all the arguments alpha. So we have to derive this with respect to alpha. So that's going to be equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n. What's the derivative of this term with respect to alpha? 1 over alpha. 1 over alpha. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and what's the derivative of this term with respect to alpha? E. Well, if you expand this, it would be negative alpha times log of xi plus log of xi. And only one of these has an alpha in it. This would end up being negative alpha times log of xi. And if you derive that, it just becomes negative log of xi. So that's the derivative. And once you have the derivative, you're laughing. Lots of optimization techniques end with this. If you can write into a computer an expression for the derivative, you could just pass it off to most commercial optimizers, and it would just give you back a value of alpha that maximizes this. We have been using this trick of setting this derivative equal to zero. And if you set this derivative equal to zero, I'm not going to write it on the board. But you know, just to be clear, you got the log likelihood. Then we took the derivative of log likelihood, and we got this expression. Oh, and just to be clear, this expression, I often will put the sum as far inside as I can, and that would make this equal to n divided by alpha, because this is just 1 over alpha added n times, minus uh, do, 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 the sum of log of xi's. Now, as I said, this is a pretty satisfying answer. Most times I give exams, this is the final answer that I'm looking for. I'm like, give me an expression for derivative, because if you can do derivative, you can do argmax. But to just drive that point home, we can set the derivative equal to zero, and then we can solve for alpha. And if you solve for alpha, you would get this expression. And we've done this a whole bunch in class. We've done this to the point where we can get an expression, but we haven't actually coded it up. If you set this derivative equal to zero, can somebody help me read this off the board? What's my expression for alpha? And I'll put it with a little cute hat on it. <laughs> 
Okay, what is it? N divided by? I can't see it. You have to help me. Is this exponential? No. Okay, I know it is. It's log. I equals one to N. You know, this is just an expression. Doesn't seem to mean that much. What I think really drives it home is we could put this into code. You can take these observations and we could write our estimate of alpha. And it takes these observations. Um, and you know, we could try and write some code here that instead of returning zero, estimates alpha. So if I had to code that expression up, I would probably do something like calculate my log sum. So I'd start at equal to zero for x i in my observations. I'd say log sum plus equals math dot log of x i. So this calculates that expression. And I'll take n divided by that expression. What is n? n is equal to the length of my observations. Uh, and I would return n divided by log sum. And if I run this, it gives me back a number. It says that my estimate for this parameter alpha based on this data is equal to 2.7. Oh, come on. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so this expression, you know, you could code it up uh, and this would give you equal to uh, 2.7 would be my estimate for alpha given this particular data. You know, a lot of times we use these XIs, but I don't want you to forget that in reality, XIs will be observations. It's your data set from which you're making your estimate. Okay. That is the end of our wonderful journey. I know that was hard, but like what a cornerstone of machine learning that you've learned today uh, using the Disney analogy that brings us to the end of our wonderful movie. But of course, there's always a sequel. Come back on Wednesday and we will continue this wonderful conversation. You guys are fantastic. Go to section, practice MLE, do it on your problem set. Have a good time. I miss you. We will see you on Wednesday.